Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And today we're continuing our study through 2 Samuel. The title of our study today is Rejoicing in the Lord. And we're going to look at 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 19. Would you please join me now in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of study in your word which is living and active. It's able to penetrate to the heart of the heart of the matter. And Lord, as we look at this passage today, I pray, Lord, that we would not only see worship just as something we do on Sunday, but that we would see that it's it's for our whole life and that our whole lives are before your face and they're to be all for your glory and for the spread of Christ's name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to 2 Samuel 6. 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 19. Hear what the word of the Lord has to say to us today. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. And so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. And, and David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole of the multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisin to each one. And then all the people departed, each to their own house. This is the reading of God's holy, precious word. Dale Ralph Davis tells of two men who were headed to a reception on a rainy night in Washington, D.C. during the 1860s. Each of the men offered to share his umbrella, and since the two men were headed in home in the same direction, as they sloshed through the wet streets, they struck up a discussion about current events. And at one point, the second man expressed the opinion that General Ulysses Grant was highly overrated as the commander of the Union Army in the Civil War, which was still going on at this time. And this is a view that he would not likely have spoken out loud if he had realized that the man holding the umbrella as they walked was none other than General Grant himself. Davis comments that the man acted foolishly because he did not know with whom he was dealing with. And so it was for King David, as he brought the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. Ordering the procession according to his own wisdom, David had been shocked that the Lord slew Uzziah, one of the men leading the Ark on an ox cart. And when his hand had touched the holy object in order to study it, now in Hor, David had stopped the procession and deposited the ark in the home of Obed Edom the Gittite. In order to resume the procession safely, the first thing David would need was an accurate appraisal of the God represented by the ark, who he is and what he is like. And when it comes to reckoning with the holiness of God, sinners are tempted to walk away in avoidance. And it's possible that David was so led, thinking, it was simply too difficult and too dangerous to deal with a God who is this holy. And yet he was reminded that the holy God is also the sole giver of life. Which he le when, and when he learned of the blessing that had come to Obia Edom's home while the ark remained there, Second Samuel 6.12 says, It was told King David, 
the Lord blessed the household of Obi and Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. And having been reminded of the blessing that comes only through the presence of God, David renewed his attempt to bring the ark of the covenant up to Jerusalem. In fact, verses 12 through 19 relate David's second attempt at worshiping the Lord, an attempt that began with a sincere appeal to God's word and therefore ended with great rejoicing. And the key insight that motivated David to return to God's ark is also the key to this chapter. God's blessing on Obi and Edom's house showed that the Lord does not reveal himself to destroy, but rather to give joy and life. And we do not know in precisely what way the Lord blessed Obi and Edom, although one ancient Jewish historian records that he was lifted from poverty to financial riches. And however Obi and Edom was blessed, his prosperity was concrete, it was real, and so that everyone could see it. And when the good news came to David, who had presumably returned to Jerusalem to continue ordering his kingdom, he was reminded why he had originally wanted the Lord's presence in his city. And the blessing of God's presence was most fully revealed in the coming of Jesus, who said this in John 10.10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so in the intervening three months, David had come to a vitally important realization when it came to handling God's ark. You see, we do not know whether he had observed obi Edom's conduct, or more likely, whether he had consulted God's word to learn what error he had previously made in bringing up the ark. What matters is not how, but what David learned. That God's blessings come to those who obey God's word. 1 Chronicles 15, which parallels the account of 2 Samuel 6, tells us that when David began to bring up the ark again, he gave careful instructions that mirrored the teaching of Scripture. And what a difference it would make once David had consulted the word of the Lord. And first, David implemented the proper biblical procedures for transporting the ark. First Chronicles 15.2 says, David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of the Lord, for the Lord had chosen to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And the previous attempts to bring up the ark had ended when Uzzah, one of the sons of Abinadab, touched the ark and was slain. And David now realized that the part of the problem was that only the Levites, in fact, only members of the Levite clan of Kohath, were permitted to transport the ark. God's symbolic presence was so holy that even the Kohathites were not able to touch the ark, even look at it. And they had to cover it and then transport it with the poles provided for moving. And David learned these instructions in Numbers 4, 5 through 15, having finally consulted God's word in order to learn God's will. 1 Chronicles 15.15 15 tells us that the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. And what was so special about the Kohathites, you might ask? They had to be the ones to transport the ark. Well, the, the truth is there's nothing special about him, them, but only that, that God had called them to this office. According to John Calvin, their office did not come from their own dignity or even their own virtue. It was because God had called them to it. Koath's dignity in having his sons carry the ark did not arise from his uh, precedence in the order of birth of Levi's offspring, since he was the second born and not the first born of Levi. The Koathites were chosen for the holy work simply by God's grace and ultimately for God's glory, not because of any human attainment or even merit. You see, by obeying the commands of God, David expected better results in his second attempt to bring up the ark. And so he explained in 1 Chronicles 15.3 to the Levites, because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. And David had discovered the secret of being blessed by God, which is really no secret at all. It's just to plainly obey the scriptures. And second, having obeyed God in terms of the officers and the means through which the ark would be transported, David adhered to scripture in offering sacrifices as the ark went up to Jerusalem, 2 Samuel 6.13 tells us. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And not only did David have the Levites offer proper sacrifices before the Lord, 
He was careful to have the Levites prepare themselves according to Scripture. 1 Chronicles 15.2 says, Consecrate yourselves so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 14 says, And so the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And this consecration consisted of ceremonial washings to signify the need for holiness in the service of God. Psalm 24 recalls this event, saying in Psalm 24, verse 3, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? The answer is given in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. You see, by those perfect standards, we may as well give up any thought of serving God or standing before the Lord's holy presence. See, God has graciously made provision for cleansing of his servants. By washing and putting on clean garments for service, the Levites acknowledge their sin and look to God for the holiness that he provides through cleansing, the cleansing blood that pointed forward to Christ and the renewing of, of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says this in Titus 3, 5, that he saved us not because of works done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And having consecrated themselves for service before the Lord, the Levites offered sacrifices as the ark proceeded up to Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 6, 13 says, And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And although the text says that David sacrificed the animals, it's likely the priest performed these sacrifices on his orders. And two kinds of sacrifice seem to have been made during the ark's procession. The first was a sacrifice for atonements of sins. And 1 Chronicles 15, 26 relates that they had sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. And these animals were normally used for sin offerings. And with these offerings, David and Israel humbled themselves as sinners before God's grace, acknowledging that all their service was tainted by sin and appealing to the divinely appointed means of forgiveness. We likewise come to God today confessing our sin and appealing to the blood of Christ, confessing our sin and appealing to Him who alone can forgive us and cleanse us from all sin. And Calvin reminds us that we cannot invoke God or even give Him thanks unless it be founded upon the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that everything which proceeds from us will be accepted in Him. And in addition to the sin offerings were thank or even peace offerings, which expressed the people's sense of gratitude to God. You see, the ox was used for these offerings, as was the fattened animal. That is an animal that had grown fat on a year's worth of feeding, and therefore was a costly gift to make to the Lord. And these thank offerings correspond to the tithes that Christians bring to the Lord today. Having these offerings made to the Lord every six steps suggests that David sought to symbolize his need to consecrate each portion of the procession with a kind of Sabbath sacrifice, acknowledging that all was done through the rest that God alone provides. And finally, when the ark arrived in Jerusalem, it was brought to a tent that had been specially prepared by David. Verse 17 says, They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And this tent does not seem to have been the original tabernacle, which might have been destroyed in, in, the, uh, on, in the fall of Shiloh a generation earlier. First, First Chronicles 15.1 says that David prepared a place for the ark and pitched a tent for it. And in this way, David uh, did his best for lodging God's ark in Jerusalem, probably building the new tent according to the original tabernacle's design. And once the ark was established, its resting place was consecrated with more burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord, verse 17 says. And in applying the lessons of David's procession of the ark up to Jerusalem, Reformed theologians have identified what is called the regulative principle of worship. What this means is that it's the worship of God must be strictly regulated or governed by God's word. This is exactly the lesson that David learned between his failed attempts uh, and his successful effort to bring God's ark to the royal city. And the same lesson had been taught generations earlier to Aaron when his, when his sons engaged in a worship innovation at the tabernacle. 
According to Numbers 3, 4, Aaron's son, Nadab and Ehu, offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, and they were slain by God. We did not know exactly what unauthorized fire entailed, except that it was an approach to God and worship other than what the Lord had commanded. And God rebuked King Saul for doing worship his own way, pointing out that to obey is better than sacrifice in 1 Samuel 15, 22. And David did not or Jesus, excuse me, denounced the hypocritical religious leaders of his time for worship that taught as doctrines the commandments of men in Matthew 15, 8 through 9. In fact, Hebrews 12, 28 through 29 urges us to offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And these connections, they make it clear that the Old Testament obligations for biblical worship continue today in the Christian church. And so in answering the question, what worship is acceptable to God, our generation answers that acceptable worship is that which we sincerely believe is best. David's experience in bringing up the ark reinforced by, by the corpse of that sincere worshiper Uzziah was different. The Westminster Confession of Faith 21.1 explains that the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men. And this means, as Daryl Hart and John Mueller write, the simple test for good worship is whether it conforms to the Bible. And this standard has become known in what the Reformed Church has called the regulative principle, they say. And the regulative principle simply states that whatever we do in worship must find its support in the Bible. And the regulative principle does not suggest that the Bible provides us with a strict order of worship, or even that our worship must be dictated by only a small number of biblical texts. And instead, of, of by appealing to clear commands, applicable examples, and a statement of principle in the Bible, we may deduce by good and necessary consequence from God's word what are the proper parts for the ordinary worship of God's people. In addition to specifying that worship must be based on explicit explicit scriptural warrant the regulative principle distinguishes between the elements of worship and the forms and the circumstances of worship in short the elements of worship refer to what god's people are to do when the gathered church comes before the lord for worship and these elements include the public reading of scripture the faithful preaching of god's word the offering of solemn prayers the singing of sins and of psalms and sacred songs and the faithful administration of the sacraments. And also important are the forms and the circumstances that have respect to the how of worship. In fact, in bringing up the ark, David ensured that the divinely appointed officers followed the biblically prescribed means for bringing the ark and the offering of biblical sanctioned off or sacrifices before the Lord. And we too should ensure that the public worship is only led by biblically qualified and called male church officers to oversee the elements of worship to ensure their biblical fidelity and now observing how seriously the lord takes our worship demanding that we worship only in accordance with his own wishes as revealed in scripture we will change our attitude when christians gather to give praise to god and the neglect of the regulative principle is so widespread among bible believing christians and churches today that virtually any human innovation is brought into the churches today without any interest in conformity to the principles taught in God's Word. So popular trends, examples of this, include video and dramatic skits in the place of preaching, comedy routines, life skills, psycho psychological training, instead of God-centered biblical doctrine. And especially in the affluent West, where personal choice and preference are sovereign in most activities, people wonder, why worship should not also conform to their own wishes and their own wisdom. If not guided by the preference of the congregations, others think that the worship service should be geared towards the consumer desires of the evangelistic target audience in the surrounding community. Why are these attitudes wrong? Well, the answer is that worship is offered to God, not either to the congregation or even to the unbelieving world, and that true worship is intended to display God's sovereignty and God's wisdom. And the, elect of the, the neglect of this principle can only have the double effect of obscuring the church's witness to God's glory, while at the same time 
subjecting God's people to worldly influences. For instance, evangelical churches are admitting women into the ordained ministry so as to preach and to lead the public elements of worship in the churches. And the clear reason for this innovation is to present a more gender tolerant image to the unbelieving world and also to accommodate and incorporate recent cultural shifts in regards to gender distinction. Well, the problem is that the scriptures plainly restrict such ministry to biblically qualified elders. Just as David was to properly glorify God by having only the Kohathites transport the Ark of the Covenant, our churches today must submit to God's will by maintaining clear gender distinctions and leading worship and in our witness to the God who made man to bear his image in terms of two clearly differentiated generals, genders, male and female. Likewise, Christians must resist every kind of fleshly innovation in the worship of God. John Calvin is right when he said, First, it tends greatly to establish God's authority when we do not follow our own pleasure, but depends entirely on his sovereignty. And second, such as our folly, that when we're left at liberty, all we're able to do is go astray. And then, when once we have turned aside from the right path, there is no end to our wanderings until we get buried under a multitude of superstitions. Now, the key insight that led, da led to David's biblical reformation of worship was prompted not only by God's slaying of well-intentioned but disobedient Uzzah, but in the blessing gained in the house of Obed-Edom. And David remembers that through obedience to God's word, blessing comes to God's people. And therefore, David insisted on biblical care and worship, not only out of fear of God, appropriate as that motive is, but also in anticipation of the rich blessing that would come when he glorified the Lord through biblical worship. In fact, in considering the matter of worship, we must not only avoid the error of worldly innovation on the one hand, but we must also flee the equally uh, deadly error of legalistic em empty ritualism on the other. How foolish it was for David to bring up the ark according to the way that seemed right to him at the expense of Uzziah's life and David's reputation. But how wrong it would have also have been for David, having ascertained the proper manner of worship, to have come before God with a heart that was proud for its achievements or that deemed uh, the glory of the Lord. See, the proper balance for our worship is set forth in Psalm 211. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. You see, God's people must be careful to fear him so as to obey the commandments of his word. And at the same time, our all-filled worship should be suffused with a great joy because of the blessing of knowing so great a Savior and Lord. Now, David's conduct before the advancing Ark of the Covenant exemplified both humility and great joy. His humility as seen in the doffling of his royal attire so as to put on a linen ephod, that is, the garments of a simple worshiper. And some scholars point out that the reference to a linen ephod might mean that David dressed himself in the attire of the priests perhaps usurping this office that was so restricted to the Levites. But this is unlikely, because David would, have been David would have committed so obvious an error at a time when he was being so careful to obey the biblical guidelines, or the Lord would have blessed David's labors if he had done so. And for this reason, it seems more likely that David's linen ephod consists not only of the full priestly outfit, but rather of the Levite's sacred undergarments, so that David humbled himself and dressed as just one of all the people gathered before the Lord's ark. And the complaint for David's wife, Michal, was that the king had uncovered himself in a vulgar fashion in verse 20, and likewise suggests that David was attired far more humbly than in priestly regala. And the point of this is that instead of presuming on his own prerogatives as king over Israel, David came before the Lord as a simple believer. And we likewise should not come to God in worship in our own pomp and pride, but like David should humble ourselves in appealing for the forgiveness of our sins and in seeking no other garment in God's presence than the righteousness of Christ alone, which we receive through saving faith in Jesus. And far from being laid low by his humble station before the Lord, David rejoiced greatly, exhibiting his inner exultation by dancing before the ark as he led the procession up to Jerusalem. Verse 14 says, David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And according to 1 Chronicles 15, 16, 
David also commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers who would play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals, to raise sounds of joy. And since in his previous attempts, David had summoned virtually all the Levites in a vast host, drawn from every corner of Israel, 30,000 representatives in all, we can assume that a similarly massive festival parade followed David as, as the ark came up to Jerusalem. In fact, 1 Chronicles 15, 28 through 29 declares, And so all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting to the sound of the horn, the trumpets, and the cymbals, and made loud music on harps and lyres. And, and as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out uh, the window and saw David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. And now David's dancing before the ark does not constitute a legitimate biblical precedence for dancing in our churches today. We need to remember that this was not a regular meeting of Israel for gathered worship, so that David's example does not provide a basis for such activity in worship today. David's dancing does, however, provide a strong biblical mandate for worship that is not only biblical, it's also joyfully exuberant. Christians gather as those who have every reason to rejoice, and therefore spiritual delight ought to be evident in our worship. The shout of God's people and the blasting of triumphs brought down the walls of Jericho when Israel entered the promised land. And some of the Jesus will return to the earth with the sounding of the trumpet and shouting from newly, newly resurrected mouths. And Christians should hear that trumpet whenever the gospel is preached or sung, and the clamor of God's grace in our hearts ought to produce a joyful excitement in our worship. David danced in the joyful assurance of God's approving smile because of the grace represented by the Ark of the Covenant. And believers today hear the scriptural assurance of pardoning Christ, and they sing hymns that celebrate Christ's atoning blood and our justification through faith alone in Christ. Our hearts ought to barely contain the joy that the gospel ought to stir within us. And when we read that David arrived with the Ark at the prepared place of resting in Jerusalem, he made the final sacrifices, and then he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts in verse 18. And here we see an example of the benediction that ministers offer at the conclusion of worship services today. Blessings that should be considered as prayers for the, uh, for the recipient of God's blessing in the heart of his adoring people. And so you see David's words of blessing, they provide a further occasion of rejoicing among the gathered people, just as Christians today should depart uh, from the worship services and the joy of scriptural benediction spoken by their pastor and with confidence of having laid hold of such blessing through faith in Christ. And you see, it's not just ministers who should respond to the joy of the Lord with the words of benediction. All of our speech and all of our interactions as God's people should be sprinkled with grace and prayerful appeals for the receipt of God's full blessing through faith in Christ alone. And a notable example is recorded in the journal of the famous missionary John G. Patton, through whom the gospel came to the savage people, the new hybrids. Patton recalls his heart rendering parting, part, parting from his father as he went away to share the gospel, knowing that in all likelihood the two closely knit men would never see each other again. And so Patton recalls how his father walked with me the first six miles of the way for the last half mile or so. We walked on together in almost unbroken silence. His lips kept moving in silent prayers for me, and his tears fell fast when our eyes met each other in looks for which all speech was vain. We halted on reaching the appointed parting place. He grasped my hand firmly for a minute in silence, and then solemnly and affectionately said, God bless you, my son. Your father's God, proper, uh, father's God prosper you and keep you from all evil. Unable to say more, his lips kept moving in silent prayer and tears, tears we embraced and then parted. You see, it's with such words of blessing that Christians should typically address one another, especially in response to special occasions when we're reminded of the rich blessing of God's grace on our lives. Patton testified later that the memory of the scene not only helped by God's grace to keep me pure from the prevailing sins, but also simulated me in my studies that I may not fall short of his hopes and in all my Christian duties that I might faithfully follow his shining example. 
Now, one final note especially connects David's leading of the ark up to Jerusalem with the ministry of his greater son, Jesus. After blessing the assembled people of Israel, a vast host representing the whole of the people, David distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. And then all the people departed each to his own house, verse 19 says. And Christians today see a parallel in the bringing up the ark to Jerusalem, to the ascension of Jesus, to his sovereign throne of heaven, which is also accompanied with gifts. As seeing our Savior enthroned above brings joy to our worship, and it spurs us to offer praise to God in his name. What gifts has Christ bestowed on us, having ascended to the throne of glory and power in heaven above? Well, Christians rejoice to receive the forgiveness of sins, adoption into the Father's love, and the righteousness of Christ for justification, and heirship with Christ in the glory yet to come. And Paul picks up the image of David's bestowing gifts when he speaks of Christ as sending the Holy Spirit to grant spiritual gifts to his people upon his ascension in heaven. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And what a joyful blessing it is for Christ's people to have received spiritual power for life and ministry through the gifts of our worship leader, the sovereign King, Jesus Christ. And the news from the house of Obed-Edom offer good tidings of joy. Second uh, Samuel 6.12 says, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. And David responded wisely in faith and in obedience to God's word, bringing joy to his own heart and rich blessings to the people of Israel. The ark of God, symbolizing the glorious presence of the sovereign Lord of hosts, was now received into the very heart of the new kingdom under David's rule. How much greater blessing will come to every heart into which Jesus Christ will receive to love and to reign through humble, joyful faith in the gospel. In fact, the gospel of John expresses how the coming of Jesus brought the ultimate fulfillment of everything that the Ark of the Covenant represented. John 1, 14 and 16 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And David rejoiced before the Lord because of the ark of God's presence would reveal the glory and the grace of God to the people, bringing life and blessing to all who trust his word. And how great is our joy to all people, bringing life and blessing to all who trust in his word. How great is our joy as the people of Jesus that since the same glorious God has taken up flesh to live among us, and having conquered sin and great in death, now comes by a spirit to live in our hearts with, with life and peace and joy to everyone who believes in Christ alone. Well, as we wrap up our time today, I want to say a few other things. And that is, what we see in this passage is what worship really looks like. It understands that first we have to be biblical in our approach to worship. You know, David blew it, he messed up, but he went back to the scripture. He studied to see, hey, what does the Bible say? He actually read scripture. He became informed by, by what scripture teaches. And the same is true in our worship today. It's not first and foremost what I feel like doing or what I even think about a certain topic. topic. It's what the scripture says. That is so important today because we have all sorts of people telling us, this is what worship is. Worship according to your feelings. Worship according to your thoughts. Worship according to your desires. And so it's all about me. Me and me and me. And that's sad because what we see here is, is David's great care to, to refine and to be shaped by Scripture is so vital for us today. Because Worship is not just some activity that we do on Sunday. Worship is all of our lives before the face of God and for His glory. Worship is not a trite matter for our lives. We worship God in our, in our thinking, in our, in, our, in our private interactions. You know, even when we think nobody can see, God sees what we do in private. God knows. So worship is not just a, a, a matter of our corporate gathering. It's a matter of our private lives because we bring our whole selves. 
And God sees our whole selves. He sees our hearts. He knows the length of our days. And he knows our thoughts. And that should be not only the most comforting thing, it should also be the most humbling thing. Because as we come before God, we are always in his presence. And God knows. And God sees. And that's why we should keep short accounts with God. Because that's a matter of worship. And worship is not just something that we do. We think, oh, well, worship is just something I do on Sunday. It's something that I've engaged in. No, worship is something more. Worship is our whole life. Because God, he sees us. He knows us through and through. We cannot fake him out. We cannot pretend, play pretend and think that it's going to be all right. We might treat worship as just something uh, uh, casual, but we should not do that. We should treat worship with the proper reverence that it deserves. To worship God is to live before his face and for his glory. With our hearts set, dead set on the worship of Christ and the expansion of his kingdom in the world for God's glory. And that's so important because it's not ultimately about us. And that's why worship is the great need of our hour. Everyone is a worshiper. Make no mistake about it. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us very clearly God sets eternity on our hearts. And God knows and God sees and he knows where we're at today. You cannot fake him out. You cannot pretend where your treasure is. Jesus says there your heart is. He knows the true estate of your heart. He sees through where you're at. And that's why we all need to repent. We think, may think that there's some compartment that God does not own in our lives. And we are mistaken because God owns that compartment. And just as he owns every part of our lives. And so may we humble ourselves before Christ. Because God gives grace to the humble, scripture says. And he resists the proud. And that's why we should repent. Because we have a great need of Christ and a, and a great Christ for our need. And he meets that need down to the nanosecond in Jesus because the blood of Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice that, that we need, that we sinners need. But it's not just for our salvation to get us into the door, to get us into heaven. You see, the blood of Christ is needed down to the nanosecond for the Christian. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I need Jesus as a Christian. I need Jesus down to the nanosecond. Because he holds me fast. He holds me secure. He's growing me in his grace. And that's a matter not just of getting in the door. Do you know that forever and all time, we as God's people will stand before Jesus in his presence in heaven and we will worship him and declare his worthiness we will declare his glory in the new jerusalem the question is what, what kind of worship are you offering to the lord is it just your feelings and your thoughts and your emotions or is there is there, is it more and what i want to say is it's more we need to refine our understanding of worship according to God's word so that we might walk in a manner worthy of the God who has called us in Christ, the God who has saved us because of his death and his burial and his resurrection. And maybe today you're watching this or listening to this episode and you wonder, my life is not being lived according to God's glory and according to the word of God. And I would say to you, repent and believe in Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, and God will save you. He'll open your eyes to see Christ. He'll draw you by his spirit, and he'll save you. You know, but, but today maybe you're watching this or listening to this, and you just feel crushed, crushed by the weight of life, crushed by what's happened in the past year, and you feel overwhelmed with the flood of emotions. And I want to say this to you, that God sees and God knows and God cares. You are not beyond his uh, careful gaze. 
In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus invites us to come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden, and, and, and help and find rest in him. And you know what? For many of us, that's what we need. We need to find rest in the one who has settled the matter for all time and for all of history. And that is Jesus. You can find rest because Jesus is utterly sufficient for you and always will be. And you can come. You can come to him. And you can pour out your heart to him because he is the God man. He is perfectly and fully God and fully man. And you can run into his capable arms. He will love you. And you can cast your burdens on him who loves you and cares for you because he summons you, Hebrews 4, 16 says, to the throne of grace. And it's there in Jesus, in his arms, resting in him that we find true joy. And we can be renewed and strengthened in the service of Christ because all of our lives, whether it's our ministry, whether it's our marriage, whether it's uh, whatever it is, it's all a matter of worship, and it's all to be done for God's glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you first for this time that you've given us to open this great text of Scripture. And I pray, Lord, that you would use this time in our lives. Help us to come and evaluate ourselves, evaluate our worship, evaluate our lives in response to this message. And Lord, may you do a work by your Spirit and not only conviction, but also comforting us as you do by your grace through, through the grace of Christ. And so, Lord, I thank you for your word that's living and active. It's able to penetrate into our hearts, that you see us and know us, and yet you love us because of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.